your sort of sampling. Um, um, so that is sort of independent of whether you're on uh, land up here or whether you're in the water down here. Um, there's lots of different types of, of sampling design. Um, you can think about things in sort of very random um, uh, fashion with a simple random sampling in the upper left hand corner. Um, you can think about things in a stratified sampling protocol. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, on the bottom left hand corner, you can think about things in a very systematic way. Um, there's also something called a systematic random sampling as well, which you see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, so from my experience in West Siberia, my sort of individual strata that was very important to sample was to ensure that I had uh, enough um, sampling in both the permafrost and non-permafrost areas. Um, the other important thing was to ensure that I actually, I go back here for a moment, had watersheds that sort of spanned the um, sort of amounts of, of peatlands actually within each watershed. Um, so that was quite important for me to, to have some sort of um, knowledge about the landscape in order to determine what was going to make the most sense for me to move forward. Um, so again, there, there are different opportunities and, and different reasons why you might actually use these different types of sampling design. Um, for instance, if you were to go out and measure active layer depth, um, it's a very sort of systematic grid sampling uh, approach um, in that bottom left hand corner. Um, not quite works quite as well when we're sampling rivers and streams and things like that, but um, again, there's lots of things to, to think about in terms of, of our overall design. Um, so as I mentioned, my interests really are about thinking about things from a landscape perspective and thinking about sort of how we can um, sort of almost scale up our overall field observations. Um, I mentioned that I spent a lot of time looking at satellite imagery, a lot of time utilizing GIS as well. Um, and sort of the, the nice thing about remote sensing and GIS is that when you're in the field, you can only be in one place at one time. The nice thing about sort of uh, utilizing satellites and, and GIS is that we can extrapolate over space and time and theoretically we can actually be every place every day um, if, if, if we had the available data. Um, the problem of doing remote sensing and GIS in the absence of field measurements is that you really need field measurements to be able to interpret um, what you're actually seeing. So you need to calibrate your, your satellite data, you need to validate things, and so it's really important to sort of have um, sort of the intersection of, of both of those approaches. Um, so what you're looking at here sort of are some previous um, uh, uh, projects that some of undergrads from Clark have, have undertaken before. Um, it's quite important, and I, th I think I saw Rob is going to talk about this a little bit as well. Um, in terms of your overall sampling design and sort of experimental approach, to think a little bit about your end members and to think a little bit about how um, those end members are going to play a crucial role in thinking about how uh, you can interpret uh, your data set. Um, so for instance, you might have soil poor waters, you might have streams, you might have rivers, um, you might have the Arctic Ocean as, a, as an end member, um, but it's quite important to think about all the sort of different potential end members that you might have across your, your landscape. Um, the lower left hand corner that, that you're seeing um, is essentially a satellite based observation approach of chromophore dissolved organic matter. Um, and dissolved organic carbon um, across the entire Colorado River main stem. Um, so that sort of colored um, uh, sort of scale from white to purple to uh, green all the way down to red essentially is giving you an overall sense of uh, the variability of uh, uh, GOC and CDOM across the entire landscape. Um, now again, we could never in a million years have done that without field sampling to actually calibrate the satellite data in the first place. Um, but uh, with that information, we're able to be and observe places that we weren't 
uh, physically located at dur during our field campaign. So it becomes quite useful for, for getting a feel for what happened in different years where we weren't in the field um, and also in different locations along the main stem. Um, so we get a, a feel for, you know, do we have downstream loading of DOC? Do we have uh, different concentrations sort of off, uh, off, um, uh, off coast into the, the Arctic Ocean? Um, so again, one example of, of scaling up. The middle, what you're seeing there, essentially the a project that Blaise Denfeld worked on. Um, she essentially took measurements of uh, uh, PCO2 concentrations, sort of, uh, and sort of uh, interpreted them into CO2 evasion rates from stream and rivers. And what's quite important um, in thinking about things over the long haul, over um, sort of landscape uh, scale. Uh, um, sort of measurements of, of how much CO2 is actually uh, evading off of these um, streams and rivers essentially is to understand the overall surface area of river and stream um, stream areas. And so based on her GIS extrapolation, she was able to get a feel for, um, you know, based on her field measurements, really how much CO2 was, was uh, outgassing off of these water body surfaces. Um, we have Dylan, um, who you guys, uh, if you haven't met her, you'll meet her this summer, um, worked on a terrestrial based project as well, where she actually looked at several different end numbers of both above and below ground carbon stores um, and uh, associated that with satellite remote sensing and was, was able to extrapolate that to get a, a sort of broad um, uh, map of both above and below ground carbon stores, which is what you see in the below right down there. Um, so again, so field observations are incredibly important. Um, satellite data is also very important. And linking the two can provide some pretty powerful, um, powerful ways to observe the overall landscape. Um, so um, really quickly, um, I'm just going to sort of bounce through three things that you actually heard from Max a little bit, but I'm just going to reiterate as well. Um, things that are important for me to continue to think about as I'm thinking about sort of, um, you know, uh, broad landscape scale um, questions and thinking about sort of overall drivers of the variability that we might see. Now, Max actually mentioned um, the aquatic surveys. Um, uh, the first I want to talk about just briefly, briefly, is the stream and river aquatic survey that's been going on. This will be our fifth year um, this coming summer. In 2012, we started up in 2008. Um, and what you're looking at in the top left-hand corner there essentially is a, a very zoomed out version of what you've seen before um, with Landsat satellite data as the backdrop. Um, you sort of see Chersky in the yellow font up there and a uh, number of the sub-watersheds that are actually within the broader Coloma Basin. Um, and of course, looking at the satellite imagery, this is a, a false color composite, for those of you guys that, that have satellite experience, um, of Landsat data, um, really showing you the variety of, of landscapes throughout the region. Um, so our, our aquatic survey really captures um, certainly these broader, larger sub-basins, but certainly the smaller streams um, as well. And so you can certainly see in the bottom left-hand corner there that we see uh, wide uh, variability in terms of uh, DOC concentrations from, for instance, soil poor waters, which might be one end member, down to streams, rivers, and then the Coloma main stem. And capturing those in the aquatic survey really um, gives us an idea of, of what the potential drivers are um, of the variability that, that we actually are observing. Um, so in the lower right-hand corner as well, you see sort of a composite of four different um, uh, plots there. Um, and again, just to sort of show you the variability across the landscape. So we've got vari variability in topography in the upper left-hand corner. We've got variability in terms of the ice content of permafrost. Now you remember, obviously, it's all completely continuous uh, permafrost, so aerially coverage, uh, we have 90 to 100 percent uh, permafrost. But the ice content is actually somewhat uh, variable, which you can see the highest ice content in the dark orange and, and varying all the way down to low ice content in the lightest orange that you see there. Um, wide variability in land cover, wide variability in soil type, all of these things you guys will, will notice in the, in the field. Um, so the questions that you could ask uh, when we have this type of information is, 
uh, understanding the, the drivers of spatial variability in stream and river biogeochemistry. So are things being driven by land cover? Are things being driven by land cover uh, elevation? Are things being driven by soil type? Um, all sorts of things that you can sort of glean from these spatial data sets. Um, the second quick thing that, that Max has uh, brought up as well that I sort of want to reiterate a little bit is the opportunity, hopefully, that we'll have this summer to sort of reinvigorate the lake aquatic survey as well. Um, so what you see on the bottom essentially is a, a time series of uh, satellite radar imagery um, across the season back in 2008. Um, and the Red circles and the blue circles are there just for context, um, just to show the variability. Um, certainly seasonally, these lakes are highly dynamic. Um, there's high seasonality in terms of the linkages of these lakes um, with uh, streams and, and rivers throughout the area, which is highly, highly important for understanding how biogeochemical constituents get transported across the landscape. Um, so you saw that I mentioned about Claire Griffin's work with the remote sensing of DOC and CDOM in the upper right hand corner here. What you'll notice is that there's a stark absence of lakes in the plot, right? So we see the main stem, but we don't see any lakes there. And it's not because the lakes don't exist, but it's because we didn't have a chance to calibrate them very well in, uh, uh, during our field season so far. Um, we also certainly see wide variability of, of the color of lakes. And you see in the photograph at the very top uh, middle there. Uh, and of course, if you can see it with your eye, there's a good chance that the satellites are going to see this, uh, something very similar. Um, so satellites, for the most part, what we're dealing with are operating in sort of the visible part of the spectrum, which is the sort of part of the electric magnetic spectrum that we can see with our own two eyes as well. Um, so uh, in terms of, of being able to quantify that, it's incredibly important to, to understand how these lakes are, are um, varying over space and over time as well, to get a feel for hydrological linkages, to get a feel for how carbon is transported all across the landscape, how important are these lakes as overall uh, sort of capacitors of, of this material. Um, so being able to do something with these lakes, I think, is, is going to be highly, highly variable. Um, and then lastly, um, we actually have a really nice opportunity um, starting, I guess, last year, and it will hopefully continue throughout this summer as well, um, that we actually have very high resolution satellite imagery that we're going to have at our disposal as well. Um, what you're looking at in the bottom, it actually almost looks like um, photographs, but those are actually taken from satellites. Um, the spatial resolution, each individual tiny little pixel that you see up there is about a half of a meter. So you can actually, of course, pick out boats. You can pick out buildings. Um, you can probably pick out a group of people as well out there. Um, and so being able to have this very high resolution uh, satellite imagery really revolutionizes the types of questions that you can actually ask. And one of the things that popped out to me um, quite dramatically with looking at the satellite imagery are the really severe um, mixing zones um, that we see both in the rivers as well as in the lakes as well. Um, you can actually see the station in the top left-hand corner. You can sort of see where that is in the satellite imagery below. And just across the river, across the Pantelonia River, um, you can actually see what is actually Coloma main stem river water. It's actually a braid off the, the Coloma main stem. Um, and you can actually see the little uh, eddies that are, that are forming as that water, um, that very different type of water is being um, mixed into the Pantaleja River. Similarly, in the, the lake on the bottom right-hand corner, you can certainly see mixing zones as well. And those types of interactions of, of waters will provide a really nice um, opportunity to do some nice transects across the rivers as well as across the lakes to get a better feel for how sort of these light absorbing impurities, whether it be CDOM, um, total suspended solids, uh, chlorophyll concentrations, um, how these things might impact biological production, biogeochemical processes, and certainly the heat balance of these surface waters as well. Um, and being able, to, again, to see this from satellites as we're in the field as well will be highly, highly variable, uh, highly, highly valuable. Um, OK, so very quickly, last slide. Um, I don't want to go into this in great detail, but um, you know, I mentioned some of the science questions that I'm interested in. But of course, 
we have lots of uh, sampling um, protocols and instrumentation that we're going to be utilizing in the, in the field as well. Um, you guys saw the big sort of survey piece of paper that, that um, Max showed last time as well, um, getting a feel for all of the different parameters that we can actually measure in the field as well as in the lab as well. Um, Secondly, um, we actually have a really unique opportunity to measure vertical profiles of light transmittance um, throughout water column. You can actually see that in the um, sort of uh, top right hand corner there, which is a, uh, essentially a, a profiling radiometer. So it measures light at different, different depths in the water column. Um, so very important to get a feel for how ultraviolet radiation and also photosynthetically active radiation, um, PAR. Um, how that transmits in, in water bodies. Lots of really important um, science questions that, that play out from that. Um, we'll also have the opportunity to take vertical profiles of temperature, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, pH, things like that. Um, David Mayer, who's my PhD student, who's going to be in the field with us this summer um, as well, we actually have, uh, are just developing a, a plan to put out a network of level loggers, um, which you see on the, the right hand corner here. Um, uh, solar and level loggers, which essentially measure um, very uh, small changes in pressure, which can tell you something about um, the overall height of water as uh, you get sort of drastic seasonality in rivers and streams and, and lakes. We can measure those uh, quite, um, uh, you know, to, to a pretty um, uh, small, um, precise, um, you know, centimeter scale precision. Um, and then lastly, Max actually has, has recently purchased a uh, side scan sonar system that is uh, going to be mounted on, on one of the, the boats out there and um, providing the ability to actually map the symmetry, mostly of lakes, but perhaps also rivers as well, which is quite important when we start to think about sort of the biogeochemical as well as, as, well as the hydrological dynamics um, of these water bodies. And again, being able to, to link that back up to JS uh, uh, analyses as well as remote sensing. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. I know I talked uh, longer than I wanted to, um, but at least that gives some uh, things to um, ask questions about down the line. And um, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to you guys about um, any of this stuff at any time. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, we're going to move on to Rob Spencer next. Rob, I think uh, you should be okay to get started. Is that right? Thanks, John. Thanks, Karen. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Rob Spencer. I'm a scientist here at the Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts. Um, a little bit of background, I've done a lot of work in the Arctic in recent years, but always in Alaska. And so this is my first trip to Siberia. Excited to be joining you all. Um, and I think one of the students was asking about this before. There are a number of us that are kind of you know, not affiliated with universities. And so for the at-large students, if you're interested in any of the ideas, or even not the outlier students, if anyone's interested in any of the ideas we sort of talk about, put forward, please feel free to, to email us and you know, we can start discussing projects and trying to set things up before people go out to Siberia. So hopefully this will follow on nicely from what Karen talked about tonight and a little bit of sort of the stuff Paul and Eureen talked about last week. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to focus on this year, which is really hot spots and hot moments in the Arctic carbon cycle. Um, as a little bit of a review, I think you guys have seen this sort of stuff before. So, you know, we care about permafrost because it's this huge store of organic carbon that's frozen, locked away in these soils uh, in the Arctic. And obviously, as the Arctic starts to warm, this is going to mobilize. And so we're interested in what's going to happen to it in the contemporary cycles. This material that's been locked away for 10, 20,000 plus years comes back into the modern carbon cycle. And so that's something that I'm going to focus on a little bit tonight. And then the second question is uh, the figure on the right. I think we've seen these sorts of maps before in these talks where people have shown increasing and decreasing productivity. And this is a map of Alaska. And it's really what's going to happen to vegetation as it changes in these systems, as different species start to recede or dominate. And also this increase in burn, which I think a couple of the next talks are going to focus on. And so hopefully the research ideas I'm going to present now tie into all these big Arctic carbon cycle changing questions. Um, someone showed this last week. Uh, I can't remember who, but it, I think you've seen this a few times now. And so this is the classic modern view, if you like, of mobilization of carbon from the land into inland waters, streams and rivers. And so you can see large processing within those inland waters. And 
what I'm focusing on is getting at that CO2 evasion number and the processes that drive that. And something that we haven't really touched on, uh, some of the projects I'm also interested in will be getting at the long-term fate of this material in the ocean. And so if you look at that diagram, obviously the material goes out to the ocean, but it doesn't stay there forever. It just cycles on longer time scales. If you like, Karen showed some nice images of streams that are brown. The ocean's not brown, so we know that carbon's turning over you know, in a very basic way. So with that in mind, um, that's why I sort of want to focus on, if you like, these hot spots and hot moments. And these are commonly found at the interface of terrestrial and aquatic environments. There's a great paper by McLean and others, which I'd be happy to send to folks who are interested in this. And so the first diagram there, if you like, shows a classic convergence of hydrologic flow paths. And so Karen just showed a lovely image of that where you've got small streams coming into the column and main stem. I think Irene showed a great shot last week where she's looking at permafrost streams, you know, permafrost thaw coming down into the column and main stem. And so there, if you like, you have a, a hot spot for biogeochemistry. And the way I like to think about that is you're bringing the fuel and the, the kindling and the flame together and you get the fire. And so it's kind of like a natural chimney. You produce lots of greenhouse gases under that scenario. And then the other scenario, sort of on the right, is where the flow path can carry a reactant into a substrate containing another reactant. And so you might have a stream with low DOC but high nutrients coming into a lake with high DOC and low nutrients. And so there you can form another type of hot spot, if you like. And so these hot spots are areas on the landscape that show disproportionately high reaction rates relative to the surrounding areas. And then obviously we also have hot moments, which are these short periods of time that show very high reaction rates compared to, if you like, the long-term average. What I've focused on a lot, and you'll have to forgive the quality of this slide, it's not uploaded very well when it's been put into Blackboard, but it's sort of how hydrology impacts on the hot moments. And so here you see the blue line is discharge, and this is in the Yukon River for one year. The red dots show DOC concentration, and the yellow dots indicate the bioavailability of that carbon. And so you see there's if you like a hot moment at the spring fresh air. You get very labile carbon, you get lots of carbon coming out. And so that's one of the things we're interested in this year. Sort of we, obviously we're not there long enough to look at seasonality like this, but we can look at storm events in small streams. And it's getting at the different source of this material. And Karen sort of touched on this, and this is something that I'll focus on a bit more now. And so if you like in the fresh air, you get the previous fall's organic matter is flushed in, it's been frozen in place, the previous fall, it leaches and that goes, lots of overland flow as the ground beneath it's frozen and that flushes into the streams and into the river. So you get this direct transfer of very fresh, very biolabile, lots of organic carbon. And then through the summer and autumn, you get movement into the soil column and so then you get reduction in the DOC that's exported, you get greater time for microbial mineralization of that material. And then in winter under ice, we have a completely different scenario that's dominated by groundwater flow. And so you can get these different end members that are bringing the, the organic carbon into your system. And so why is this important? You know, why is the reactivity of this material important? If you like, why do we care? And so under this scenario, and I focused on permafrost here because this is one of the things I want to look at this summer, if you imagine the mobilized DOC is recalcitrant. So as the permafrost thaws, the material that's thawing out, is, it's just going to sit there and not do much. You won't see a lot of evasion of CO2 from the soil column. You won't see a great amount of DIC export, but you will see a lot of DOC export because the material is very resistant to microbial degradation. And so through the stream network, you won't see much change except addition of DOC. And so because this permafrost material is very old, 20,000 plus years old, you'll see an increase in the radiocarbon age at the mouth of Arctic rivers and an increase in DOC export. But if it is reactive, then we'll see a lot more CO2 evaded from the soil. We'll see an increase in inorganic carbon export into the river network. And obviously, we'll see a lot more CO2 evaded from within that river network. We may see a decreasing DOC export to the ocean, maybe no change. But we won't get that telltale radiocarbon increase in age either because it's all been utilized within its hydrologic residence time. And so if we're interested in global cycles, what this means for permafrost thaw, mobilization into streams, then export to the ocean. This is why we need to know how reactive this material is. And so what I'd like to do a lot of work on this year is all the vegetation types we can basically find, um, classic like end member leaching of those sort of materials, 
a whole suite of surface soils and sediments on floodplains and those sorts of areas, to look at some of the burn materials from some of the work that's going on in some of the old burn areas, and also obviously to look at permafrost and some of those questions related with that. To collect this material, bring it back to the lab, do a range of leachate experiments, to assess its reactivity, to get at its fate, you know, how quickly it's going to cycle and potentially get back in the atmosphere. Predominantly probably focusing on biological ability, but there's also potential to do some photochemistry as well. I think Paul might have touched on that last week. And then I'd also like to try and relate this into its composition, because that's one of the great things about the lab at Chersky, we can do a lot of the wet chemistry there in-house. And so with this approach, we're hoping to find the hot spots. So it could be, as Karen just showed, that beautiful area where this little permafrost stream comes into the main stem, and to look at these hot moments. And so if we find it's permafrost thaw that's causing this, then obviously late in the summer when you get maximum permafrost thaw, that's when we'll have our hottest moment of the year, if you like. And then to see if we can find common features that control its reactivity, either in the organic matter chemistry, its composition, if you like, kind of like we as humans prefer to eat cupcakes than liver or something horrible. Microbes prefer to eat certain types and forms of carbon. And so we can do a lot of work looking at that, or to see if it's nutrient limited. And so I'll leave it there, and we can move on to the next person, unless uh, anyone's got any questions. Okay, remember, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, and I think uh, if Alexander Holodoff, if you're online still, and if you have good uh, audio, uh, it would be great if we could hear from you. I think I have your slides loaded up next. Um, Alexander, would you just uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Alexander Holodov. I'm from University of Alaska Fairbanks, and uh, I'm going to do a kind of uh, permafrost research during the summer around the Chersky area. And uh, could you please load my uh, presentation? Uh, presentation I sent to John yesterday. Okay, thank you. So the permafrost is a very important part of of Arctic ecosystems, and from uh, one side it plays it plays significant role in uh, a lot of biogeochemical and uh, different kind of natural processes there. And from another side, uh, permafrost is very sensitive uh, to the any kind of natural changes. First of all, uh, climate changes, but uh, also for uh, vegetation and landscape changes. From another side, uh, permafrost warming and consequent thawing or degradation can lead to the active layer thickness increasing and uh, in topography changes, in hydrology regime changes, and uh, in biogeochemical cycle changes uh, in, some in the region. So what uh, what methods uh, I'm going to use this summer? Uh, we can use a drilling to uh, to get uh, material for analyzing, and from another side, drilling allow us to to do different kind of logging. So if uh, you are not very convenient, drilling is a process of uh, producing hole in the ground for extraction of uh, natural resor resources, like a well drilling for oil, gas, or uh, water or for exploration of the nature of the material underground, so-called parametric drilling. It's what we usually do. Uh, and another kind of drilling is just producing of the hole to install some equipment for lodging. Sometimes we use this, uh, this approach when we just need a hole to put some temperature loggers. Uh, of course, it's uh, the best way to study any kind of quaternary deposits. It's a uh, not drilling, but outcrops. But uh, drilling also can give some benefits because uh, it allows us no, uh, not only describe deposits, uh, but also to do some lodging. And uh, also, it can be used sometimes when we don't have a very good exposure of deposits we would like to investigate. And the, the last but not the least, uh, Drilling is the best way for sampling for, si for microbiological and some biogeochemical purposes. Here you can see uh, our drill rig we usually use. It's uh, designed by uh, 
it's a Russian designed equipment which uh, is pretty portable. It's not handy, but uh, it still can be easily located for some distance. It's a mechanically driven uh, engine with gasoline engine and can be used both for uh, auger drilling if you just need a, a hole. You can, uh, as you can see on this picture, but uh, also we can use a corer to get some material. This uh, drill rig allows us to dip up to 50 meters deep, but usually we don't need so deep uh, bore holes, and usually we do like a, up to 25 to 30 meters. And uh, sometimes we were able even drill a solid rocks, like a slightly weathered basalt, but uh, fortunately we don't need to do it in Chersky area, so we have a fine grain sediments. Which and our equipment works perfectly with this kind of sediments. So what we can do around the drilling from a scientific point of view? First of all, when we extract a core, uh, we have to do a general description, which includes a lithological description, like determination of what kind of deposits, its color, granulometric composition, structure, uh, any inclusions, and everything. And here you can see some pictures of these examples of frozen core. And it's uh, when we are working in uh, permafrost area, we need to also describe so-called cryogenic structures, so different kind of uh, ice forms in in this uh, in in core, and you can see on. Uh, do you see uh, my uh, when I move mouse? Can you see a picture I show? Uh, here you can see so-called suspended uh, cryogenic structure when uh, more than half of of core presented by ice, and we have some pieces of uh, of soil submerged in submerged in ice. And here is more uh, layered structure, cryogenic structure, when we have a pretty clear uh, la uh, layers and lenses of ice. And here is so-called reticulated, when we have a kind of grid formed by ice layers. So next step, uh, usually we do sampling, because we have some material, we can do it for different purposes, for lithological com composition, uh, for, for any kind of lithological analysis, but also we can take it for microbiological purposes. We can also take uh, samples of gas buried in the permafrost. And there are different strategies of sampling, usually we use uh, like, a take samples with some uh, regular interval, but uh, taking into account what each lithological or cryogenic unit should be sampled. So for microbiology purposes, if you do sampling for microbiology purposes, uh, key point is uh, to keep uh, to to avoid any contamination of of samples. So it should, the question of sample sterility is a key key question for it. And uh, microbiological samples should be uh, put in the sterile metal boxes or plastic bags or any any kind of sterile uh, sterile bags, and should be kept in frozen state. It's better to keep it uh, with temperature under the four uh, minus four degrees of Celsius, because it's uh, as we know it's even with negative temperature with temperature minus four degrees Celsius and below, uh, it, it could be some uh, microbial activity and organic decomposition. Very low rate, but, um, but it's, still it's, it's possible. Uh, another way which you, uh, another kind of research we can do around the boreholes is different kind of logic. And first of all, what we do, we do uh, temperature measurements inside the borehole. It's what uh, it's our activity in frame of uh, thermal state of permafrost uh, project, which relates to the different kind of research. Uh, result, uh, results of t thermal state of observation can be used for different kind of research, like a carbon pool estimation, uh, methane and greenhouse gases emission some exogenic processes like uh, erosion, coastal erosion, river erosion, and, and so, so on and so forth, some soil processes. 
here is the scheme uh, I would like to propose how we can instrument uh, boreholes for uh, continuous observation. We do a casing of upper one or two meters of boreholes uh, just to prevent water inflow from the active layer when it's third. Uh, we would like uh, I would like to put four channel uh, thermistor string inside the borehole connected to the Hobo U12 for channel data loggers uh, for continuous observation. But as well, somewhere nearby the boreholes, I, uh, borehole, I would like to put additional uh, temperature sensors, temperature and soil moisture sensors inside the active layer to get the, the whole picture of uh, heat transfer from uh, atmosphere to the, uh, through the active layer to permafrost. And uh, also, I'm going to do to, to measure uh, to measure uh, thermal conductivity of active layer soils, and uh, for to, to determine thermal conductivity of permafrost of frozen uh, soil, which we can extract from from the boreholes. And here you can see a four-channel Hobo U12 data logger. We use a standard equipment for such kind of to instrument such kind of boreholes. And uh, here I would like to briefly present some um, results of our temperature observation on the Kolyma lowland by the red stars uh, marked places where when we already have some boreholes instrumented for long-term observation. It's one is pretty close to the Chersky and right between the Chersky and Pleistocene Park. It's uh, on the Ambolika channel across the old place of Sergei Zimov stations. Also, we have two uh, two sites with instrumented boreholes, Duan Nayar and uh, a little bit downstream from the Amalon River, the Kalama, and uh, nearby the Akhmelo Lake. It's also not far from Chersky area. Also, we have two, borehole, uh, two instrumented boreholes uh, along the Chukashi River in the western part of Kaluma Lowland. One is uh, on the Chukashi River mouth on uh, uh, Chukashi Cape, and second is the uh, middle part of Chukashi River. So here uh, you can see some results of our modern observation. Uh, the upper plot is uh, temperature dynamic, uh, permafrost temperature dynamics on different depths. Uh, it's a boreal forest zone. It's the temperature one is uh, for Amalon River mouth. The red line is uh, temperature dynamics on 10 meters. Green line is 15 meters, and purple is 25 meters. And lower one is uh, observation at one year. The same uh, red one, uh, red line is 10 meters deep. A green one is uh, 15, and purple is 25 meters. Here there is, uh, we have some gap uh, of obse of data for the 25 meters deep because um, once uh, one of sensors cable was uh, damaged by the by the animals, I believe, because uh, for some reason small animals like a polar foxes, squirrels, ground squirrels, for some reason they very like to chew cables. <laughs> So you can see uh, we can observe sustainable uh, trend of permafrost temperature increasing on uh, all the depths in boreal forest zone on Kalama Lowland. Here uh, on this plot, uh, on left plot, uh, I would like to show a comparison of historical data and uh, results of modern observation data uh, on the Chukashi River in the middle part of Chukashi River, and you see what during the like 20 years, uh, we have uh, permafrost temperature increase in 2 degrees here. And on the right plot, uh, shown the modern observation on uh, Cape Chukachi. Also, you can see sustainable uh, increasing of permafrost temperature there as well. And the most interesting part, uh, it is Ambolika channel pretty close to Chersky and pretty close to the uh, Pleistocene Park and uh, I think it's close condition what we will drill this year. And it is only the spot 
where we don't uh, we do not observe any significant changes of permafrost temperature on the uh, below the layer of seasonal temperature variation. So you can see on on the depth uh, 21 meters, permafrost temperature is more or less stable. It uh, has some <coughs> excuse me, not very significant seasonal changes, but it doesn't have any significant uh, interannual changes. And we also compare this data with uh, results of uh, permafrost temperature measurements have been done and in 1981, and we also don't see significant changes in those time. Uh, how it can be explained? Uh, only explanation I can propose right now is significant l landscape changes uh, took place in this area during the last 20 years. You can see on the black and white pictures how it looked like uh, in 1980s and on uh, color pictures uh, the same spots, exact the same spots but uh, 20 years after. So these pictures uh, were made in two, 2009. So first of all it's uh, spreading of shrubs vegetation and second it's growing of tussocks. Both of these processes uh, lead to the snow redis redistri redistribution during the beginning of winter, and uh, which, le uh, which leads to the uh, very fast active layer freezing during the beginning of winter and consequent cooling of permafrost. And such changes can uh, like reduce to uh, reduce influence of uh, climate warming. So that's it. Uh, I would like to say uh, to say thank you for attention. If you have some question, you are welcome. Okay, uh, Alexander, if you could turn your microphone off, that would be great. And uh, we're going to move on to Heather Alexander now. Uh, hopefully, Heather has worked out some of the technical issues she was having. Uh, so when Heather gets done, uh, we're going to try to get Sue and Natalie uploaded so she can give us some information about herself. Uh, I screwed up with her PowerPoint and hers is not uploaded yet, so there will be a small delay between Heather and Sue uh, that one of the other uh, PIs will fill with some sort of stand-up comedy routine if you guys don't ask questions. I think Karen is probably the funniest one of all, so she'll step in after Heather to uh, entertain you. So Heather, if you're ready, uh, take it over. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me talking? Yeah, we can. You sound great. Sound great. I'll try to move closer and talk loud. How's that? Whether you sound good, okay. you don't really need to talk talk that much louder than you in your normal voice. Okay. Well, hopefully you guys can hear me. If you can't, just uh, please leave a, a note on the chat so that I can adjust this. But my name is Heather Alexander, and thank you guys for being here this evening. I am a postdoc at the University of Florida, and um, I'll be transitioning into a faculty position at the University of Texas at Brownsville this fall. But I am a plant and ecosystem ecologist, so I'm interested in understanding the interactions of plants with their environment, um, how the environment affects their growth and survival, but also how plants can alter their own microenvironment. But I'm also interested in how uh, energy and materials and elements flow through ecosystems, especially with regards to how changes in plant communities can affect those flows. So my research in boreal forest has been focused on trying to understand the cascading effects of human activities, especially the, our emission of greenhouse gases and the effects of uh, climate warming on uh, disturbance regimes and how changes in climate can produce 
intense, severe fires that differ from how they used to be, and then how changes in disturbance regimes can affect environmental conditions. So light availability, water, nutrients, and then how vegetation communities reorganize themselves in response to those changes in environmental conditions. And then how changes in vegetation communities can affect ecosystem functions, such as the ability of forest systems to accumulate and store carbon. So for the last four years, I've been working in boreal forest of Alaska, but I've also spent one summer in Chersky um, in 2010 uh, working on larch forests there. And boreal forests are a broad belt of mostly coniferous tree species, so needle-bearing trees that ex uh, exist in high latitude areas, so between 50 and 70 degrees in the northern hemisphere. They stretch across Alaska, Canada, Scandinavia, and all 11 time zones of Russia. And in Alaska and Canada, Boreal forests are comprised predominantly of black spruce. This is an, an evergreen conifer, so it holds its leaves all year round, interspersed with deciduous species such as paper birch and uh, aspen. And then in Eurasia, boreal forests are predominantly pine and spruce, but then as you move further east into Siberia, it's uh, mainly larch, and larch is an interesting tree species because it's a conifer, but it's deciduous, so it loses its leaves each year. And it's also very interesting because it's, it grows atop continuous permafrost, and outside of Siberia, if you're atop continuous permafrost, what you see is tundra. So it's a quite different um, boreal forest ecosystem compared to what we see in Alaska. So boreal forests are important for a lot of reasons, but one reason that uh, we're all interested in is the, is the fact that they store a lot of carbon. So approximately 703 petagrams of carbon are stored in boreal forests. This is about the amount of carbon that's stored in our atmosphere, twice as much that's stored in tropical forests. So this is in uh, trees and then the top uh, soil layers. If you look into deeper uh, mineral soils, this number is actually much higher. So just based on these numbers, it's about 35% of global terrestrial carbon stocks. And it's interesting because the Canadian and Boreal Forest Initiative calls it the carbon the world forgot. And this is because I think usually when people think of carbon, they think of biomass stored in things that they can see. So you think about a tropical rainforest, and you think of large trees storing a lot of carbon. But in the boreal forest, it's different. It's really cold and wet, the growing season is short. There's more carbon that's uh, produced by plants during the growing season that actually decomposes throughout the year. So what happens is you get a lot of carbon accumulating in the soil organic layer and then being uh, uh, distributed down through the mineral soils over time. So in boreal forest, fire is the primary disturbance. Fires occur during the growing season, so usually between June and September, these are um, ignited mostly by lightning, but in areas with uh, dense human populations, humans can also unintentionally or maybe in intentionally sometimes set fires. And they naturally occur every 80 to 120 years, depending on where you are. They are typically crown replacing or stand replacing, sorry which means that they kill most of the overstory trees, setting the stage for secondary succession. And so while fire is a natural part of boreal forest ecosystems, there's been quite a bit of evidence suggesting an increase in fire activity in conjunction with climate warming. So this is a satellite image over um, Russia taken in July of 2010 that shows all the wildfires that were burning on a single day. So every red dot represents a different fire, and that white cloud that's over the center is actually smoke and not clouds. So this just tells you the effect of these fires um, on the atmosphere and also just how extensive they can be. So if you look at data uh, from North America, from Alaska and Canada, it shows um, an increase in fire extent over the last uh, 30 years or so, and also increased prevalence of more extreme fire events. 
So the question that I'm really interested in is, what is the fate of boreal forest carbon pools as fire activity increases? So as fire activity increases, there will be a decrease of, in carbon that's stored in plants and soils because the fires are coming through and they're consuming more of this carbon. That carbon will be transferred to the atmosphere as CO2. And that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So this is predicted to cause a positive feedback to climate warming. And this has gained co considerable attention in the press because of the potential consequences for this. And people are really worried about um, what this might mean for future climate. But really, the potential for this positive feedback ultimately depends on forest regrowth during post-fire succession. So you can imagine that a lot of carbon is being lost to the atmosphere, but if that carbon is regained during the subsequent fire-free interval, then it might be a wash. It might not be a positive feedback at all. Or you might actually accumulate more carbon than what you lost, or you might accumulate less carbon. And so I'm really also really interested in trying to understand how could increased fire activity affect forest regrowth? So one thing that could happen is that if you increase fire severity, you could shift the density. So I'm talking specifically about large stands here. So fire severity is the relative proportion of organic matter that's consumed during a fire. So you can imagine that if you were a tiny little large seedling under a normal severity re regime and you landed on this really big soil organic layer that accumulates in boreal forest because it's so cold and decomposition is so slow, that when your radical or your root starts emerging from the seed, that you would have to grow a very long distance before you reach the mineral soil. And your chances of desiccating in that porous organic material before getting there is really high. So your chances of survival might be really low. But if a very severe fire came through and consumed uh, a large proportion of that soil organic layer, reducing its depth, and you were a seed and you landed on it, then the distance your radical would have to grow before reaching the mineral soil would be much less. And so one hypothesis is that uh, you increase fire severity, you might end up having much denser larch stands than you would have had in the past. And so we were really curious about what changes in density might mean for carbon accumulation. So when I traveled to Turkey in 2010, I uh, worked with Mike Laranti at Whistle Research Center and Scott Getz also there, uh, Michelle Mack at the University of Florida, and Kamala Earl, who was an uh, undergraduate student at the time who came along with us to participate on this project. And we sampled um, 17 large stands undergoing post-fire succession, very close to the uh, research station there in Chersky, which is represented by the red star. And each of the different numbers on the map are different stands. And these stands varied in age from about 5 to 205 years old and in their density. So even in stands that were approximately the same age, especially mid-successional stands, we saw quite a bit of variability in density. And then we quantified carbon pools in trees, soils, and woody debris. And what we found was that when you move from a low density stand to a high density stand, and this is holding age relatively constant, that these high density stands store much more carbon in their soils and above ground uh, tree parts than, than low density stands. And a lot of this is due to the fact that you're just, you just have more trees and they're packed more densely and so they're, they're accumulating and storing more carbon. So the really interesting question is, what are the mechanisms controlling stand density? We think it could be soil organic layer depth because this is what they've shown in other boreal forest ecosystems, particularly in Alaska, but we don't really know that. There are so many different things that come into play when determining the density of a stand. So not only do you have to have large seeds, but they have to be viable. They have to have the appropriate conditions for germination. The seeds have to be able to live through a winter and uh, grow and survive the sub in subsequent years. And so this question is the, uh, the question I'm really interested in addressing this summer. So what I'm going to be doing is conducting some plot level experimental burns to uh, manipulate the depth of the soil organic layer, measure how that changes soil conditions, and then sow large seeds into these plots to determine the effects of changes in the fire regime on their germination and establishment. So, this summer, um, we're going to conduct the burns. We'll measure all the soil conditions, sow seeds at the end of the growing season, 
uh, right before snowfall, which is when they naturally fall, and the next summer uh, assess their germination and establishment rates. And then another question that I'm very interested in trying to understand are the feedbacks between stand density and carbon pools. And so this summer I'm hoping to set up some uh, studies along with Sue Natale and Mike Laranti to um, try to better understand how large density affects microclimates, so things like understory light. Um, litter, leaf litter accumulation, both light and leaf litter accumulation can be very important for controlling the development of mosses. And mosses, because of their insulating properties, could have very large um, impact on below ground soil carbon pools because they could, changes in moss could change the soil thermal regime. So I'm hoping to uh, set up some studies in a, along a density gradient to get at a, a these, how the, these changes in carbon dynamics. All right. Well, that, I think that's all that I have. If, I'd be happy to answer any questions while John is uh, setting up the next set of slides. Okay. So while I'm uploading this, I can't actually speak to you or send you any messages. So uh, if you have questions for Heather or any of the other speakers, let's take a little bit of time to do that. Uh, Sue, I'm going to upload your slides now, so just keep watching your screen and uh, hopefully it will all work out just fine. And I will get back online when we're all ready to go. All right, can everyone hear me? All right, great. Um, so my name is Sue Natale, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Florida. And this will be my first time traveling to Siberia, so I'm going to talk to you more about the research that I'm doing and that I have been doing over the past few years. And then I'll talk a little bit about the work I'll be doing in Siberia. Um, I'm glad that I'm following Heather because I'll be collaborating for the most part with Heather on the, the fire experiments and some of the large stand densities. So I just want to give you an overview of the type of research that I do and then some of the tools that I'll be bringing with me um, and look forward to other collaborations that we can develop with students and scientists on the project. Um, so I'm a terrestrial ecosystem ecologist. I'm broadly interested in looking at interactions and feedbacks among climate, ecological communities, and biogeochemical cycling. Since 2008, I started working in Alaska um, in this postdoctoral position with Ted Shore at the University of Florida. Um, and I went to Alaska to look at the effects of permafrost thaw and warming on um, loss of carbon from ecosystems. I've also done some work on trace metal biogeochemistry, so that's another um, an interest of mine as well. Um, so most of my research is conducted within the framework of climate change. So the question is, how do we study climate change? There's a couple of different ways we can do this. One option is to just you know, take a long-term observation and sit around and wait. Um, the other way is to do some experimental manipulations. And this is what I've been doing um, in tundra ecosystems in Alaska. So the top two pictures on the left um, is a warming experiment that I've been working on since 2008. And the picture on the top right is a drying experiment that I established in, in 2011. Um, so in Siberia, we're going to be doing some of these experimental manipulations. Heather mentioned the, the experimental burns. But the other thing we can do is um, you can, if you want to look at the effects of different types of climate change, you can just look at some of the natural variation that you already have across the landscape. So this picture at the bottom, this is a tundra ecosystem. And this is a natural permafrost thaw gradient near Eight Mile Lake, Alaska. And if you just look across the landscape and you want to ask questions about what's going to happen when permafrost falls, well, you can find areas where the permafrost is falling. You can see this low-lying area here. And you can see a lot of differences both in the physical and biological and ecological aspect of this thawed area versus an area that's not thawed. So again, in Siberia, we're going to be looking at some natural stand density gradients. And we can ask some questions about, well, what's going to happen if these, if these um, we have a different fire regime, and we start seeing differences in large stand density. OK, so this is a really basic cartoon of a permafrost ecosystem. And I'm sure everyone 
here now is aware that we're interested in permafrost because permafrost stores a lot of carbon. Um, but there's a couple other really important things about permafrost. I'm very much interested in the mechanism of change and what's causing some of the changes that we might be seeing in carbon pools. So in addition to storing carbon, permafrost is really important because it controls the physical boundaries of the system. So permafrost is any ground that remains frozen for two or more consecutive years. It can contain soil. It can be comprised of partially decomposed animal and plant material. It can be comprised of rocks. And also there's a lot of ice wedges in permafrost. And these ice wedges are really important because as they melt, the physical structure of the ice is now gone. And you start to get areas of subsidence, which you can see on the right-hand side of the picture. So the ground just kind of subsides down. This changes the microtopography. Um, and it, it, it causes some really important effects in terms of the soil environment. Um, you often find these areas are a lot wetter. The water table gets closer to the surface. And this, in turn, affects ground thaw. So that area of the ground um, that thaws annually is called the active layer. That's really important for biological activity. So permafrost also controls um, the biological environment by determining how much of the ground, you know, well, by directing how much of the ground thaws annually. This is really important for plants. Um, these permafrost systems are very often nitrogen limited. So if a plant only has a limited area for its roots to sort of explore for nutrients, um, this can be ex exacerbated by a, very, a permafrost layer that's very close to the surface. So with that in mind, you can imagine all these changes are going to have some important um, implications for carbon cycling. Um, so again, there's a lot of carbon in permafrost. And the permafrost region stores about two times more carbon than is currently contained in the atmosphere. Um, the types of things that I measure is I'm primarily measuring carbon dioxide fluxes, um, also a little bit of methane, but I'll be um, focusing on carbon dioxide fluxes when I'm in Siberia. So as the permafrost thaws, you have a lot more carbon that's now thawed available to microbial decomposers. In addition, if soils are warmer, um, we have an increase in microbial decomposition rate. And the net result of that is we can expect to see a transfer of this carbon that had been thermally protected in the permafrost um, to the atmosphere as a result of increasing respiration. However, at the same time as microbes break down all that organic matter, they're releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. They're also releasing nutrients. Um, the nitrogen that gets released, in turn, can stimulate plant growth. So at the same time that we're losing carbon, we may also see an increase in carbon uptake. So these are the two fluxes that I'm focusing on. You also see in the bottom right-hand corner, I have in smaller um, dissolved organic carbon, particular organic carbon and dissolved inorganic carbon. And these are equally important, but this is just not something that I measure. But I think there will be some nice opportunities to bring together these terrestrial carbon flux measurements with these um, transport of carbon into aquatic ecosystems um, uh, next month in, in Siberia. OK, so just quickly, these are some results from the work that I'm doing right now in Tundra. But these are the types of data that I'll be collecting in Siberia. and. Um, and, and would be excited to work with students and other researchers. So on the right-hand side of the picture, you see that glass chamber. That's a flux chamber. Tundra is really convenient because it's so low. So I can put a chamber like this over the ground and measure carbon dioxide from the entire ecosystem. So if you, these graphs are showing you um, the effect of warming and permafrost thaw. This was experimentally manipulated and how this affects carbon flux. So the graph on the left, you can see the Blue areas are, um, represent fluxes from ground that has been warmed. As expected, we're losing a lot of respiration when we warm and thaw the ground. Um, looking at the middle graph, however, this is gross primary productivity. Um, so this is the gross amount of carbon that's taken up by plants. And surprisingly, the plants actually took up more carbon than was lost um, from the, by microbial and plant respiration. The net result of that is net ecosystem exchange. That's abbreviated as NEE. And as a result of permafrost thaw, surprisingly, the ecosystem took up about 50 grams per meter squared um, more carbon in the plots that had higher permafrost thaw than in the plots that weren't thawed. So that's a little bit surprising. But um, leaving it at that, that's only part of the story because this is just growing season fluxes and there's a lot more going on in the winter. Um, so within that context, 
Um, I'm going to be collaborating with folks on a couple projects. The main project I'll be working on is the Spire Vegetation Permafrost Interactions project that Heather Alexander just talked to you about. Um, I'm also really interested in um, characterizing just, you know, how much variation there is in ecological factors, so plant communities, environmental factors, um, across the landscape, particularly in the context of, of fire and, and, um, and permafrost thaw. So some of the questions that I'll be asking um, is one, how did changes in the environment, changes in soil temperature, moisture, thaw, and in ecosystems and plant communities affect decomposition and soil respiration. I'm interested both in the amount and age of carbon that's respired from the ecosystem. Um, how do these changes affect plant productivity? And what is the net result on ecosystem carbon dioxide exchange? So just quickly, um, I want to just give you an overview of some of the equipment that I'll be bringing. And again, when I'm not using any of this equipment, I'm happy to share um, any and all of it. And it's all fairly easy to use. Um, so I'm going to be bringing a CO2 flux chamber that we can put over the ecosystem. We can't get this over larger trees, but we can put it over the ground and use it to measure soil respiration or, um, or net exchange of carbon dioxide. I'll be bringing an infrared gas analyzer, abbreviated here as an ERGA. Um, if you look at this picture on the top right, that's a, a radial carbon trapping system. It's just a piece of Tupperware with some equipment inside. I'll be bringing some of those, and then that's attached to a trap. This trap has just some um, molecular sieve, which is just um, some clay that traps the carbon. And I run the gas through that trap, and then I can collect that and bring it back to the lab and analyze it. Analyze that gas for radiocarbon, which gives us an idea of what is the age of the carbon that's being respired from the ecosystem. The picture on the bottom right, this is Peter Ganslin, and he'll be coming to Siberia this summer as well. And he's taking some radiocarbon samples from gas wells. Um, in addition, I'll be bringing a bunch of environmental sensors to measure thaw depth, temperature, and moisture, and some other stuff. Um, and it also brings some tools to characterize the plant community. So we can, um, the picture on the bottom right, this is a point frame. This can give us an idea of plant composition. We can also um, measure percent composition of the plant community. Um, also is really important is what's going on below ground. Um, this is not very well characterized. And the way we do that is just, um, these are some undergraduates. The picture on the bottom left was just taken a couple hours ago plucking roots from the soil. Um, and this gives us an idea of, you can get an idea of below ground biomass. Um, I'll also be bringing some, a lot of incubation to jars. And I'll be bringing extra if anyone's interested in using them to do some soil incubations. And again, we can um, use the radiocarbon traps to trap the, the carbon dioxide that's being produced and ask, you know, what is the age of the carbon that's coming out of these soils? Um, and soil incubations are also another way, if you can't do a large scale experiment across the landscape, you can do something on a smaller scale on the lab by adjusting temperature or um, oxygen levels in your incubation jars. Um, I think I had to cut these slides there. Yeah, so that's, um, that's just like a brief summary of my work and some of the things I'm going to be doing in Siberia. I'm really excited to get to know all of you um, and to meet more of you. Um, this is just a couple of papers for further reading. If anyone's interested, um, please email me. I, I won't be in phone contact for a couple of weeks because I'm going to Alaska in a couple of days. But you can email me, and, and then we can get in touch. And um, I'm looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. OK, great. Sue, thank you very much. Uh, that was a pretty smooth. Uh, Pretty smooth there at the end, uh, given all the trouble we had early on. And thanks to everyone who hung out, hung on to the end. Um, I think you can see we have a really wide diversity of people that are going to be out there doing some work. Um, I want to, uh, before I let y'all go, I just want to remind you that next week uh, Andy Bunn will be giving a presentation. Um, it's entitled Occam's Razor and Climate Change, and it's uh, we some of us have seen this before. It's a fantastic presentation. It's going to also be given made available to the public. So there'll be people online with us that are, have not been before. So uh, I encourage you very strongly to make sure that you can be there, be present next week. And then next week, we'll give you a sense for what's going to happen later. Um, there's been some talk of uh, some
some sessions where we'll discuss uh, some more details about the trip and give you a chance to ask questions about uh, things that are going to be happening and, and give us a chance to all talk a little bit about how uh, this trip in July is going to go. So uh, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I think we're done for the night. I want to thank everybody for doing such a great job and being patient with the issues that we had. So, and I'll talk to you all next week. Bye-bye. Hey, Paul, Max, you guys still there? But you should be able to talk if you want, although I think there's some echoes going on. What's going on? Hey, John, I'm still here. Just yeah, listening in. That was that was that was echoes for you, Paul. Right. Let me see if I've got headphones. Max, are you still up? How's that, John? Is that better? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's great. What's going on, man? Yeah, it's good. Just uh, hanging out in my house, listening to yeah. some cool talks. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I enjoyed are that. You, are you drinking a beer by chance? No, no, I've just eaten dinner, though. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah. It never it really was, occurred uh, to me. Yeah, like, I really yeah, enjoyed we'll be, it. Yeah, good. It was good. Yeah, they did. everybody did a great job. It never occurred to me that I could they be did. sitting here getting drunk while we're doing this. Yeah, I know. Uh, Mike seems I mean, to have the right idea. But I'm, I'm guilty really of celebrating. It's his, it's his last day at the center tomorrow. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. which is why I think he's being extra. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, the pain in the ass. <laughs> boisterous. Yeah, it's just kind of a funny, funny thing because like the students have no idea that this 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 conversation is going on between the moderators. They have no idea. It's <laughs> funny. Like, they think we're all vegetarians. Yeah, they're listening attentively, and we're like bullshitting away <laughs> on the moderator. <laughs> yeah, I know. I always feel a bit bad about doing it though, because it obviously pops up when you're talking. So it, it well, sort of stresses me out a little bit, because you know, you got all these tech things popping up when you're chatting away. Yeah. So you know what you do, like, but if you put the main room on on the on in front of you when you do that, you won't see any of it coming. And I, I think like. Yeah. I don't think Sasha knew any of this. Like I sent him, a, tried to get a, get him to chat with me, and he just didn't even know what's happening. Yeah. So, oh well. I think that was good. I, I thought I saw Max in his camera, but I think he's disappeared. Yeah, no, I think anyway, Max. Um, Max did make a comment that he had to go and put the kids to bed, and then he caught right. that. That's right, he did. All right. Well, you know, I haven't. I'm in Kentucky right now, and there's a big party going on that I'm missing. Oh, you better go. You better go so join in. They'll be needing you. Go, yeah, I gotta go join the party and have something to eat. You but, go and do yeah. that, man. But thanks for doing all this stuff. It's. Uh, no, it's I think fine. the students I, will really appreciate. I hope so. It's. Uh, and yeah, that was not very well organized today. But it all went okay. I mean. But hey, we. Yeah, it was tricky. I think. Talk with Bill soon. Yeah. Definitely. I've I've been emailing him today, but mostly about Maddie coming down. So Maddie, his okay. student, is going to be coming to the center next week. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Cool. So, sounds like you're ready for a party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm an old man. I don't know what that means oh, well. anymore. <laughs> well, what time is it in Kentucky, anyway? How far is it's it? Same there. It's the same as there. It's eight thirty. 
Okay. All right. Well, you good. That's good right. fun, That's man. Good and, and yeah, well, we should catch up. And uh, yeah, next week. For sure. I've been away for five for sure. days on courses. These Arctic training ah. courses. That's right, that's right, I forgot about that's, that. That's what all the banter is about. Yeah, yeah, I wish I could have been there. That sounds like that was fun. Hey man, you'll be there next year, right? You'll be at Polaris yeah. next year. Are you kidding? Well, then, of course, God damn it! I'm never missing one again. I'm so you know, excited about this. Well, hey, you get a go. year off, yeah. and you'll come, you'll come back even more invigorated and excited. Sure, yes, Of course. All right, Paul. Thoughts. I'm sign off. All right, mate. Take I'm it gonna, easy. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick you off right now. Do it. Get rid of me. See? Well, I can remove you. All right. Okay. Bye, bye. Yeah. I'll still love you. <laughs> yeah. Same bye. Here. See you. <laughs> bye. There you go. Gone.